Welcome from Canada. I'm Stephen Downs. It's a pleasure to be able to talk to you today. So you may, as you may know, I've been involved in the development and distribution of MOOCs for some time now, starting in 2008 with the Connectivism and Connectivist Knowledge course that uh, we delivered along with George Siemens, Dave Cormier, and others. And in that time, We've seen the development of MOOCs and a lot of different models of MOOCs. And I've learned, I think, a fair bit about the way MOOCs and interactivity go together. The reason why we need interactivity in order to make MOOCs work. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. A MOOC is a massive open online course. And most of what we have to say about interactivity is based on this idea of it being an open online course. And when we developed our first MOOCs, we developed it using a theory called connectivism. And the idea of connectivism is what inspired the first MOOC. Now, the way connectivism works is that knowledge is thought of as the connections and the patterns of connectivity between entities in a network. And that learning, therefore, is the creation of these connections or the traversing of these connections, the growing and the shaping of these connections in order to create patterns of connectivity. And it's our ability to recognize these patterns of connectivity out there in the world that constitutes our knowledge of the world. Now, the way we set up the network in our original MOOC was to have everybody contribute to the course content, not just the instructors, not just the institution, but all of the individual participants. And in the first connectivist MOOC that we offered, we had 171 individual student blogs that were being written in and shared on a regular basis throughout the eight weeks of the course. A blog, of course, is a self-hosted online website that people use to create and share their own content. And it's different from a social network like Twitter or like Facebook in that each person controls their own individual blog and you don't have to use a single centralized service. So with the blog, with these contents, what we did is we used something called RSS, Rich Site Summary, or sometimes called Really Simple Syndication, in order to connect these blogs together to form the network. The RSS aggregator that we built went to each individual blog, captured the most recent contents, and then shared those contents with everybody else in the network. So the idea here was that every participant in the course had the opportunity to contribute to the content of the course and have that be heard or potentially heard by everybody else in the course. This created a social dimension to our online course that didn't exist in traditional courses, even courses with discussion boards, and certainly did not exist in the MOOCs that were developed later on by Stanford, MIT, and others. This social dimension is what created the capacity for people to learn new things and indeed for all of us to learn new things as we conducted the MOOC. Again, knowledge is the creation of connections between entities in a network. And at the public social level, it's created by creating connections between people and blog posts and services and objects and things. And in a human, it's created by creating connections between individual neurons that form when we interact with each other and when we interact with the world at large. This is how knowledge comes to be created 
in a MOOC, or at least the connectivist MOOC that George Siemens, I, and others developed. Knowledge results from this interactivity, this constant communication, this community that develops around a subject or an idea or a concept that we're all exploring together. Now, in order for this to work, we found that it was essential for the MOOC to be distributed. And what that means is that there isn't a single place where the MOOC is located, where all the activities happen. Rather, there may be a central course website, but then each individual person also has their own websites, and all of these are connected together. And we may connect with other services, perhaps discussion boards, perhaps chat rooms, whatever. The idea is that there's a bunch of individual things that are connected together. And it's the formation of all of these connections that allows knowledge to grow and develop through our interactions. Now today, on the internet, more generally, there's a concept known as the Fediverse, which is taking this idea and implementing it as a response to centralized social networking services like Twitter and Facebook. The idea of the Fediverse, just like our connectivist MOOCs, is that each person has their own individual website. Each person has their own place on the internet and they publish and they share with other people in other places. And this creates a network that people can join and people can contribute to this interactivity across the internet as a whole. An example of the Fediverse can be found in an application that I use called Mastodon. Think of Mastodon as a Fediverse version or a distributed version of Twitter or Facebook. It feels a lot like Twitter when you use it. You know, you have short messages, you have the screen where you read other people's messages, but it's not one central Mastodon server. There's many different servers, or as we call them, instances that are connected together. And this changes the dynamic of the interaction. It's not about broadcasting anymore. It's not about collecting hundreds of thousands of followers. It becomes all about the interaction, the conversation that you have with a manageable number of individuals that you can actually communicate with. And it feels very different. And I think the conversations are better. Generally, the technology behind Mastodon and similar sorts of things are characterized as the Indie Web. The Indie Web is a series of protocols that allows these individual instances to communicate with each other. And Indie Web is, again, like Mastodon, something that you can look up on Google and learn about. And there are tons of resources about it. It's still a starting idea, right? It's you know not mainstream yet. But the idea of the indie web is that people have their own individual websites, whether they're Mastodon or they're a blog post or they're a micro publishing service. And through the use of these protocols, they form the Fediverse. They form a federated internet of independent but interacting entities, a network. Now you will have heard of perhaps Web3. It's a new concept. It's been criticized quite a bit because it's associated with blockchain and it's associated with digital currencies like Bitcoin. And those criticisms are well-founded. I will agree. But there are some aspects to Web3 that are really interesting and really important to the Fediverse. And it's the idea of persistent objects, and that's what Web3 enables. And what I mean by that is, for example, you can have, using Web3 type technologies, a persistent identity from one instance to another instance to another instance in the Fediverse. Sometimes that's called self-sovereign identity. 
Also, using Web3 type technologies, we can have persistent objects that are found in various places across the, the, uh, the Fediverse, but are recognized as a single distinct object. This is known as content addressing and is supported by things like the interplanetary file system. Now, we don't need to worry about those mechanics right now. What we need to understand is that technologies are coming that will allow us to have distributed but connected networks or communities, and that these can support newer versions of massive open online courses in the connectivist model. Now, to wrap up, I want to talk a bit about the values that underlie the connectivist approach, the network-based approach, not only to MOOCs, but to the Fediverse in general. Now, the thinking behind these values is that they are based on what is required by a network in order to function effectively. Now, if you think about it, knowledge is created by the creation of connections across the network. These connections are created when we share information, contents, ideas, opinions across the network. And so we ask, how can we set up, build, or structure a network so that it most effectively transforms these communications into knowledge? That's what these values are based on. First value is autonomy. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. Uh, autonomy is, is the idea that each individual entity in the network is responsible for its own content, makes its own decisions. And if you think about it, that needs to be the case in order for connections to be formed and content to be shared across the network. If everybody is told what to do, then you're not really getting any interaction. In order to have interaction, people need to be able to have their own voice. You know, you think about a conversation, right? If the other person has to repeat everything you say, that's not much of a conversation. They have to say their own thing in their own way. Related to that point is the idea of diversity. And this is the idea that each entity can be different or distinct from other entities in important ways. Now, there, there are many ways to talk about diversity. People talk about um, equity and inclusion, multiple perspectives, different races, uh, different points of view, different value systems, different religions. All of these are aspects of diversity, but it goes beyond that. It's the ability to have different opinions on subjects, different points of view or different perspectives, to use different technology even, to use different protocols, to speak different languages. All of these are elements of diversity. Why is it necessary? Because you cannot have conversations without diversity. If there is no diversity, if everybody is the same, then there's no possibility for information to be sent from one entity to another entity because the first entity is the same as the second entity. No information changes hands. Nothing new is learned. So diversity is essential for conversations and interactivity. You don't get them without diversity and therefore you don't get knowledge without diversity. Interaction. Now I've talked about interaction this whole presentation, but here what I mean by interaction specifically is that in a network, knowledge is formed by interaction. The exchange of messages or communications from one entity to the next. The contrast here is where knowledge is created by transmission. The idea of transmission is one person has all the knowledge and they just share it, distribute it to everybody else. That's your traditional classroom model of communication, isn't it? 
And if you think about it, there's no conversation happening in a transmission model of learning. And as a result, there's no transmission happening, or sorry, there's no conversation happening, no interaction happening in most traditional approaches to education. That's why we developed the alternative connectivist model. Finally, open, openness. You cannot have, stop that. <laughs> you, you cannot have interactivity, even a network without openness. Openness means people can join and leave the network when they want. Openness means that we are open to new content, new ideas, new perspectives. Openness means we can share these ideas and perspectives freely with other people. There aren't barriers from one person to, ne to the next, like subscription fees or paywalls or any such things. So that's my time. I thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you, and I look forward to hearing from, from you sometime in the future. I'm Stephen Downs.